All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It is Thursday, December 31st, 2015. This is Wes Fryer, and I'm excited to be part of maybe the second annual, who knows, it is the second EdTech Year in Review, joined by some people far smarter and uh, exciting to look at than I. So uh, we are going to follow a, a format that is similar to the Clockwise podcast, and that is that um, each of us is going to basically throw out a question or a topic, and then we'll toss it around the table. So whoever uh, tosses out the question gets to, to have the last word and reply. So our order is going to be that I'll start, and then we'll go down to Nikki in Alabama, then we'll go to Eric in Liberty, Missouri, and then we'll go over to Jason uh, in somewhere in California. So my first question, which is kind of an introductory one, is what were you professionally doing this time last year in December 2014, and how is your educational technology situation uh, different at work in December 2015? So Nikki, take it away. Hi, I'm Nikki Robertson. I'm from Huntsville, Alabama. This time last year, I was working in a tiny little school district as an instructional technology facilitator that was going one-to-one -one with MacBook Airs. And so that was really cool because I've been doing libraries since 1997, and so I kind of stepped out of the librarian role. And I love how the school district approached the one-to-one -one rollout of the MacBooks. They started with third and fourth grade. And they hired someone like me to go into each school inside of the district. And what we did is we went in the classrooms every day, all day, of those third and fourth grade teachers that got the MacBooks for each one of their kids and helped them know how to connect those MacBooks to their curriculum and how to use them in the classroom on a daily basis. So it was embedded TV all day long, every day for those teachers which I think makes a huge difference because I have seen uh, other one-to-one -one rollouts where just all of a sudden all the kids have a device and the teachers immediately take their worksheets, make them into PDFs, stick them on the iPad and download Notability and it becomes a $500 worksheet. And so I was really excited to be a part of that. But this year I went back into the library because I had an awesome opportunity to work at a brand new school, James Clemens High School, that's one of the top in our states, and um, was given the freedom to set up a maker space in my library and pretty much reform the space from being a traditional library space to now a very loud, interactive, fun discover area with 3D printers and all kinds of other things. So I'm excited to be where I am. I miss my teachers from last year too, but I feel that I've had a great opportunity to learn many, many things from those two different experiences. So awesome. I'm going to pass it off to Eric now to tell a little bit about himself. All right. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Langhorst. I teach in Liberty, Missouri, a suburb of Kansas City. And I teach primarily eighth grade history, but they also uh, wrangled me into doing broadcasting a couple years ago. So I do half history and half eighth grade broadcasting, where we create a weekly show on Fridays. Um, professionally, last year at this time, I was working on my uh, dissertation, so I was trying to squeeze out as much time as possible, like getting up at weird, crazy hours in the morning at like you know 4:30 to work for a couple hours or something before school. Um, but I completed that, so I'm done with that, and um, just kind of focusing back on what I consider to be kind of the fun stuff, working on um, some like side projects and things like that with history and technology. That is great. And hey, I'll interject one more thing before you throw it out to uh, Jason. We do have a hashtag. Um, and uh, if anybody wants to, and we'll we'll tweet the, the links and also have these in the show notes, but if anybody wants to tweet to 2015 EdTech Review, then, then we'll see that. So, Jason. Thanks, Wes. Uh, my name is Jason Neifer, and I am the Assistant Director and Curriculum Director of the Montana Digital Academy, the public state virtual school in the state of Montana. And then I'm also, as a, a, another project, the or a tech savvy teacher in residence for the Northwest Council of Computer Education, uh, which is the Northwest ISTE affiliate. 
Um, I've had a big year personally, so um, that's been mostly my, my dominance in the last 12 months. But professionally, um, my, my life didn't slow down either. Um, as the uh, assistant director and curriculum director of the Montana Digital Academy, we uh, continue to serve more and more students each year, and we're trying to figure out ways to serve students in an all online learning environment um, while understanding what good pedagogy looks like and also um, how to grow in, in an um, economically and a pedagogically sustainable way. And so that's been really the, the dominant part of my professional life over the last year. Um, as an example of that, um, we rolled out a new credit recovery program in uh, fall 2015 um, where we developed essentially a, a custom program internally. Um, and so um, that's been really uh, the, the primary project that I've been working on from a, at least a, my, my day job standpoint. Um, that's involved taking Moodle, which has been our learning management system since 2010, and really tweaking every inch of, of functionality out of it to try to create a great learning environment for students that are in that unique position of needing to recover a credit. And what that's taught me over the last year, and, and something that I've, I've really applied to other parts of my professional life, is that we're probably underusing most of the tools that we utilize on a daily basis. Um, even super tech savvy folks, and I would account certainly um, our panel today as a um, uh, an example of that. Uh, we sometimes uh, don't dig enough into the tools to find out what they can do to create incredibly immersive, incredibly powerful learning environments. And it's something internally I've been looking um, at, at being a little more aggressive about. And so part of my 2016 will be about what are other places in my personal and professional life, um, in, in training and PD I do for NCCE, that I can help teachers and, and especially help students dig deeper into the technology they already have available to them in order to increase their uh, learning efficiency um, and, and make sure that they're using what they have available to them now um, in the best possible way. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, on that note, I'm right now in my wife's makerspace in the church that's right next to their school. A year ago, I was um, teaching fourth and fifth grade STEM at Independence Elementary in Yukon, which is a suburb just west of Oklahoma City. And uh, I'd finished my doctorate in 2011, and I'd been an instructional coach in that district for a couple years and had a chance to, to actually go back into the classroom and teach full time. So uh, in the spring, um, I was, was courted for a job and ended up accepting it and, and started in July as the director of technology for Cassidy School, which is an independent school about eight minutes from my house and has about 900 kids, uh, pre-K through 12th grade. And so now I am doing things like setting up the Bonjour gateway with the separate VLAN on our sonic wall so that our airport stuff can, you know, be solid and not drop. And our art teacher at elementary just, you know, right before Christmas, we got her uh, the first LCD TV uh, with Apple TV installed in her room because we've kind of standardized on smart boards and we're going to be offering teachers choices and especially in bright rooms with lots of ambient light. Um, it, it, but also teachers that just don't want to use the, the interactive whiteboard. Uh, anyway, that's that, that's going to be an option, so I'm excited about working with teachers. I've, and as soon as I go back on Monday, I'm in a seventh grade Spanish class because the teacher has done skits with the kids, and last year they had worked with the iPads, but we're going to do green screen and offer the kids a chance to have a skit that they write in Spanish, but they're going to perform that, but now get to, you know, trans transport themselves different places, and so I love the tech coaching side of that, but I'm getting to wear both hats as the IT geek and as the instructional coach, so... All right, well, I'm going to pass it to Nikki. Nikki gets to throw out any topic she wants related to educational technology, and she's just, we all kind of threw some stuff into a Google Doc, so we may have known a little bit, but so just throw out a topic, and uh, then we'll, we'll throw it to Eric and just kind of go around and, and see what this wise group of folks has to say about whatever Nikki wants to tell us. <laughs> well, we just came fresh off the hills of our code week um, this month. Uh, what was it, December 7th through the 13th or something like that. But I don't know, I wanted to ask you, because we all present at different tech conferences, have you noticed that except for at ISTE, when I go to tech conferences, if there's anything about coding, that's the least attended class, <laughs> or it's a very small group, and I find that teachers aren't very interested in coding. And when I did our code at my school this year, 
Uh, it was the week before finals, so <laughs> that, the teachers weren't happy about that. But it was a volunteer basis, and I did have a teacher who signed up all of her classes to come into the library and do our code with me. And she said, I was cursing you out, Miss Robertson, because it's the week before finals, and this is just games, and we, you know, the kids didn't need to know coding, but I'm glad I signed up because now that I'm in here and I'm seeing it, I'm understanding just how important this is and how it actually helps them with their finals coming up and with their coursework because it's teaching them critical thinking and, and all those problem, problem, problem solving skills, skills etc. Et and so and I think that there's a huge misunderstanding, but I, I know that when I was at ISTE, the line to get into the session about Minecraft was down and around the corner, you know. But my experience in tech conferences is if you have anything about coding in the title or it's going to be about coding, you're going to get a tiny little audience there. And so what can we do to get teachers to understand that other countries are starting to make coding and computer programming part of the basic curriculum, part of a literacy skill that starts in pre-K and kindergarten? And how can we get our teachers to understand the importance of it and to accept it into their classrooms? All right, Eric, you're on. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'll just kind of piggyback on that and then get into a topic. But I know I think well, when I think I, of I, yeah, actually, oh. go ahead and do yeah, do the coding. And if you want to tell what oh, okay, you're doing okay, with coding okay. or whatever, we'll all go around on the coding topic, and then we'll flip back for okay. for your topic. Right. So, so we've done like two hours of code different times during the fall semester, and I think one of the things that's interesting is we have so many students that are at different levels. So I have an eighth grade class. I have some kids that I've already done, you know, Ruby, and uh, they've maybe done some JavaScript, and then I have some kids that have never done anything. And so I think one of the challenges that I've had in talking to other teachers in my building about it, or the district, is that it's really just an exploratory type of environment and give the students a lot of different opportunities and as well as you and jump in and kind of see what you can do. And I think that's one of the difficulties is coding is just so big that unless you really narrow it down and have like a session on, you know, okay, this is how you could specifically get students into Java or something, it's just such a huge topic. It would be like having a session on, you know, computers or, you know, um, you know whatever, <laughs> Us using apps or something. And so right I think on. that's, yeah, so that's one of the challenges I think is like how do you narrow it down so that people can kind of really focus on maybe one area, but at the same time everybody's kind of in different, different places. All right. Jason? I, I think I would add to that that I think part of the problem with, with our code from a, um, a buy-in standpoint is that I think it, there's some marketing problems with it. Um, and I'll tell you, we struggle with this a little bit internally. In fact, we struggle a little bit with STEM internally in my organization because um, you know, we're, we're actually a, a humanities-trained uh, uh, group, the administration of my program. So we have an English teacher in our midst, and I'm a social studies teacher. We have another English teacher. We have another uh, K-8 teacher um, that, that's in our group. And you know, we, we talk quite a bit about this notion that, that part of the problem, I think, broadly with STEM education is that um, you know, it, we have to acknowledge that, that it takes every kind of mindset, whether it's a STEM background or a liberal arts background or humanities background, I think, to create a well-rounded culture. And STEM focus, and even when you turn STEM into STEAM, arts doesn't really cover, for example, what, what, what I did as an historian and a political scientist. And I, I think that that marketing problem is, is a big one. But I, I think there are some models that we could utilize that might better uh, help advertise why coding is an important concept for students to learn. Um, I'm always reminded of Harvey Mudd College's uh, approach to computer science and um, they, they had a real problem with gender diversity in their computer science program and one of the ways they, they dealt with that was to change the name of their courses and then the focus of their course um, away from uh, their, their original course was Introduction to Programming in Java, which turned into, you know, pretty much 96% males, most of which um, had already experienced Java before. So it, it was, you know, the class was a little silly from its conception. Instead, they worked on a creative approaches to problem solving in science and engineering using Python, which is a huge mouthful of a class name. 
um, and not even a good acronym either as I look at it, but it provides a, um, a way of, of, of saying this is not about you know, being in, in a dark room somewhere coding, it's, it's really a, approaching with a mindset and I think that that's where particularly the, 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 the broader hour of code uh, advocates have sometimes fell a little bit short. This is not code, this is problem solving. And that's you know the the uh, in the same way that that uh, science is using more scientific method to advertise what it does. I think the code could reinvent itself a bit um, to you look at it as a problem solving uh, piece more than anything else. And then suddenly that's a lot more interesting cross uh, curriculum. It, it's applicable then to a lot of discrete discrete areas that uh, you may have not perceived code as being important to what they do or teach. That's good. For those of you joining us, um, we, we do have a Q&A on the Google Hangout. If you want to drop a, uh, something in there or if you want to tweet into our hashtag 2015 EdTech Review, uh, we are totally ready to go down a rabbit hole that we have not planned <laughs> if we need to. Um, but we're kind of just going around the horn with uh, a different topic that each person is suggesting. And Nikki has talked about the hour of code and, and how, how we can engage more teachers in those conversations. What you just said, Jason, reminds me of a... Well, actually, the only poster session I've ever done at ISTE, it was in San Antonio a few years ago, and uh, the, the topic was changing our vocabulary in educational technology. It basically stopped scaring people with acronyms and jargon that, that folks bring baggage with, like blog, like podcast, like wiki, Wikipedia. I mean, there's things that people sort of have a natural bias to and instead use friendlier language that connects to people's prior experience more and it therefore serves as a, as a more of a bridge rather than a bridge cutter, a bridge builder. So talk radio show instead of podcast. Talk interactive writing instead of blogging. Talk, um, you know, uh, puppet show or, or green screen show. Or I, I don't know. Maybe green screen is still geeky. But um, I think part of that is changing the language. Um, of course, I'm excited to see more folks coding. Um, but at the same time, it almost feels like, let's go to the computer lab to use the computer lab. I mean, it, what we want to do, I think, is really bring teachers into an awareness of things like computational thinking, like the idea that Scratch provides this amazing environment for kids, with, which I just, we talked, my wife and I talked about this today, it's the low bar and the high ceiling. You can create something simple as a first grader to make a cat go across the screen and say, I love Minecraft or whatever. Or, you know, you can bring your, your background knowledge of gaming into it and mathematics and start doing some if-then statements and some conditionals and just really quickly getting into some cool computational thinking. So um, I, I think part of the answer is changing our vocabulary. And then I think it's also highlighting student work. I think the best way to get teachers' attention is to, is to have kids who are on fire with excitement for learning talking about what they're doing because as, an, as a teacher and an educator, you just can't ignore that. You, you know, we pay attention to kids that are on fire with excitement and learning. And I saw that happen two summers ago at the Create, Make, and Learn conference in Burlington, Vermont, where Kevin Jarrett was leading um, the, the section on Minecraft. And some of the librarians kind of weren't sure, and but... And Kevin did an awesome job, but what changed their minds, my daughter, Rachel, who was then in fourth grade, and my son, who was, uh, I guess, a rising junior, showed some of the stuff they had made. I mean, my daughter had made a shower in Minecraft, which involved some redstone and some coding, and Alexander had done this clock and very pretty complicated redstone, but it just blew away the teachers, and they were so fired up, and they were like, okay, man, we, we need to, to do this. So, Nikki, now you get to answer your own question. What do you think? How do, how do we change the perception? Right. I love all the, all the input, and I'm taking notes and going, uh-huh, now I know what to do. <laughs> but um, when you were talking about displaying student work and, and giving attention to student work, what I did last year when I was the instructional technology facilitator in the one-to-one -one school, my teachers came to me and they said, we're used to hanging student work out in the hallways, but they're creating stuff on Scratch and they're making um, iMovies and they're doing all this other stuff that we can't hang out in the hallway. So I built a virtual hallway using Weebly and would put student work on there. And as the students learned about it and the parents learned about it, 
that got even more buy-in from the teachers and I started not having to search for things to put on there or ask for them to create things. They started sending me things and the kids would even email me things that they made on their own. Can you put this on the virtual hallway? Because they were so proud of what they were doing. So I think getting that student voice in there and letting them know that what they're doing is important and that you value it beyond just a grade is one thing we really have to emphasize as well. So how are we going to display these things they're doing electronically beyond just the school wall? Okay. Well, we're uh, halfway through the panel with questions. We did my question introductory. We did Nikki. So we're going to toss it to Eric to, to throw out a question, and then we'll just keep on going around the circle. So Eric, what do you have for us first? All right. So one thing I put on the um, document was um, something that I've been really interested in the last couple months and has really been kind of catching uh, some traction in my district, and it's a breakout EDU. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, um, but I think it's something that a lot of teachers will hear about in 2016. Um, it's the concept, it's kind of reverse of an escape room, and what you do as a teacher is you create a game or use a game that somebody else has created, and it's essentially, um, in very simple, simple terms, a box that has padlocks on it, um, and then you have different, like, puzzles and things around the room, and you can tie it into whatever curriculum you want, but essentially students work together to try and solve these little puzzles or problems to be eventually be able to get to the final goal of opening a box. So what happens is, if you go to the Breakout EDU website, um, you can buy a box that has a variety of different locks that can be locks that have words on them, um, you can do things that have like, um, some of the clues could be hidden possibly with a um, um, like a, a marker that can only be revealed with a black light, um, but there's kind of a, like one essential kit that you could buy, or you could buy all those things on Amazon, and then there's a really active community that's creating games that could fit different curriculum levels, different grade levels, people have done it with faculty, um, I'm working on some history games for 8th grade right now, um, but there's been a lot of positive response from students and teachers and um, I think the cool part of it, just kind of looking from this, the outside and kind of seeing how this has evolved, is there's a super active community on Facebook, and then also they have meetings on Google Hangouts. They're going to have a, a live work-in, I think maybe next week, or maybe it's this week, I got to look at the date, where people can get together and talk about different ideas. And so the whole concept of this, like, open source, this is an idea, how can we use it, has really taken off. So if anybody hasn't checked that out, um, once you see, almost everybody that I know that once they see it, their mind just starts clicking about, oh my god, I could do this in my classroom, and um, I've done it at like a ed camps and things like that. Um, but it's just kind of a fun way to really kind of get your kids, almost kind of like a, a gamification type thing, um, with whatever curriculum you want. The games are open source, you can share them. So that's been really exciting over the last couple of months for me. Okay, so maybe we can toss this out as a question for if you've got experience with with Breakout Edu or any other kind of uh, gamification or that 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 kind of goal of of using games and puzzles and in that problem context. Jason. So I would say that my contribution to this is that uh, I've been digging a little deeper into gamification lately from the standpoint of um, I'm 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 a cynic, so I I don't know if this provides a um, a universally um, um, uh, encouraging environment for students to learn, and there is some research. It's a little, it, it's 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 being debated right now uh, in the academic research community, but it suggested that particularly for students that are self-motivated, gamification actually you know scales back their motivation. It 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 uh, decreases their their natural motivation. Um, I I don't know what what I think is the truth right now, but something that I've been looking at. Um, um, a little more deeply is is trying to kind of break down gamification into parts. Um, that uh, there are things about gamification, and and there's actually a lot of books about this uh, that were published in in the the late 2000s when um, apps started using more gamification. The check-in procedures, uh, scores, um, uh, visual data, and and so what we've been experimenting with, with in, in in my organization is um, visual uh, things like visual meters. Of, of progress, right, which is kind of an element of gamification that's showing you a score along the way uh, that's very prominent and displayed on, on a screen as you're making your way through a class can be a very 
um, a, a very encouraging way to kind of keep progress moving forward. That you don't have to go to a, a grade book, which is hard to understand and not very visual and um, it doesn't really show you progress and, um, and instead just gives you a progress meter that you know is constantly growing as you're moving your way through a class. And so um, at least for, for, for my context and for how we serve students, um, we're looking at kind of the unpacking of gamification to seeing if we can take some of the elements of it um, and turn it into you know something that, that we, we perceive works for. And part of it too is that you know in, in parts of our program we deal with very specialized groups of kids. Credit recovery kids, for example, they're a very special group of students. They're uh, you know not completely devoid of, of ability to learn on their own. Um, but at the same time, they obviously didn't pass a class for, for some reason that, that needs to be acknowledged as part of the process. They tend to be somewhat fickle consumers of, of learning. And so we've been kind of experimenting with what, can, what lessons can we draw from the uh, very popular and, and, and successful gamification movement and kind of integrate it in parts in our classes. I'm glad you're you're bringing up the contrary view. I, I'm reminded of Gary Staker, you know, coming in and, and uh, sometimes offering the, the contrary view and the challenging view, right? Because we all need to be challenged, and sometimes these things come in as bandwagons that rah rah, and do we really all want to jump on it? Um, my thought on gamification. I, I just heard Eric about Breakout Edu this holiday because I participated in the Ed Camp Voxer, which was <laughs> amazing. Amazing. I mean, just great conversations with teachers all over the place, and especially the making is learning. I mean, that group was out of control. Somebody uh, coined the term Voxer bankruptcy, which is when you just can't listen to all of the, th the threads, and you just like, okay, I'm, I'm not going back. I'm just you know, starting now. And I have not declared Voxer bankruptcy, but I got <clears throat> a bunch of stuff from yesterday to go back and listen to. Um, so last year in Philadelphia at ISTE, by coincidence maybe, or happenstance, I got to sit with uh, Michael Matera, and he's just come out with a great book on gamification called Explore Like a Pirate, and I got to read a pre-release version of that and, and actually conduct an interview with him. Oh my gosh, he he has used an amazing tool that, and he's, he's gotten all of this art from... Uh, from deviant art, and he's got permission. That's like medieval castles and all kinds of just amazing, you know, scenes. And so his whole class is this is this game where students are able to explore and have challenges. And some things, are, you know, for everybody, and and other things are optional. And some of them involve, you know, going outside the classroom on, on quests and stuff. Oh my gosh! If you want to talk about a sort of formidable, you know, high bar challenge, like, oh my, you know, it's taken years and years to get to that point. Um, gamification so much more than badges and, you know, window dressing and icing that you put on the cake. When you look at some, a classroom like Michael Matera's, you know, it's a wholesale different animal. But it's the kind of thing that kids who, who have been in that and parents have said, this was the best class my, my son was ever in. My son loves social studies and history now, and he never did before. I mean, it's, it can give that kind of a transformative experience. But it's not something that you can just say, okay, read that article, now we're doing that tomorrow. It really takes a ton more. So, um, you know, it... I don't know. I guess I want to be a I want to continue to be a learner with that, and also explore the ways that, um, you know, we we can move into some non-traditional ways of showing what we know, demonstrating our expertise and knowledge, and then being able to represent that to others. You know, the Google Certified Teacher thing is a is a cool thing, but it basically means I was selected for my passion as a teacher and my ability to make a short video, you know, to go to a Google campus for a day and inhale a fire hose of content, you know, and then hang out with these people. <clears throat> They've shifted now to the to an innovator program and something that builds on the Google certified trainer. I don't know. That that's not directly tied to gamification, but the idea of badges, the ideas of how do I show what I know and and what does that mean? It, it, you know, it, I don't know. I'm 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 interested and intrigued in all that. So, I'm glad to learn about Breakout EDU and it's something that I'll definitely explore and maybe it's something we can do on our ed camps because we've definitely had a lot of of ed camps uh, in the last couple of years. Nikki, what do you think? Well, I also learned about Breakout EDU at ISD this past year and got a Breakout EDU kit for my school, but um, it hasn't been used yet. I haven't 
pushed it much yet, but what I hear from teachers as I go out and, and while I was working as a instructional techno the um, instructional technology facilitator last year is teachers feel overwhelmed. Um, they're coming out with new learning management systems all the time. Uh, we just switched from Moodle to uh, Google Classroom and just trying to hit the door running with a new group of kids, get your lesson plans and use a new learning management system is overwhelming enough for teachers to then try to throw something like gamification or something at them like that is a whole nother thing. You know, they're trying to meet all these standards and get their tests done. And so what I get from teachers is they're just overwhelmed and there's so much out there. I also see a lot of fear uh, with teachers of, I want to make sure I've mastered this before I use it with my class. And I'm like, by the time you've mastered it, it's not even relevant anymore. <laughs> you've got to just jump in the deep end and, and swim with your kids and let them help you along the way. But it's a very scary proposal to say that to a teacher. Um, I've been in education 24 years, but I think it's my PLN that's given me the freedom to feel like I can jump in the deep end and, and try new things. But I do know that um, for teachers, it just seems so overwhelming. So many of the things that, that we are talking about, coding and gamification, is not even on the radar because they're just trying, trying to take care of their day-to-day. -day. And how can we help with that and then maybe slip some things in as we can? <laughs> Okay. Well, as we as we pass it back to Eric, um, I'm going to share a question from Twitter. Yay, a Twitter question. Uh, Daniel from Tempe, Arizona asks, uh, who needs to get involved and how to get these strategies from afterthoughts and add-ons to more integrated practices? You want to tackle that one, Eric? Is this in reference to... I think it's in reference to the breakout EDU, okay. yeah, and gamification. Um, well, just one quick thing on the uh, breakout EDU. It's not... It's not like a curriculum, it's like an event. Like you would create one of these that you might do like twice a semester or something at the moment. I mean, it's not like your, you know, gamification of the entire curriculum that you have. It's like a one day, like you spend 40 minutes and kind of like maybe incorporate a bunch of stuff into review and stuff. It's not like you're doing this every day for, you know, your entire semester. And it is definitely something that... Um, you know, a teacher would have to feel comfortable with trying to, you know, try something new, try something different. We have a, a French teacher that did one um, in November, and it just went really well with her class and things like that. So it's not really like um, an overhauling of a curriculum. It's just kind of like a fun one-day event to kind of make something new and different, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, it's not something that I don't, don't think you could, like, push on to everybody. It's just um, people that are interested in kind of you know, from a teacher perspective, want to maybe create kind of a fun event to kind of pull some things together and kind of make it a game and stuff like that. So um, as far as the question, um, who needs to get involved and how, um, one of the things that um, I like about it is you can incorporate it however you want in your curriculum. And as a teacher, you're really, like, if you build your own game, you're really working in your own curriculum into the game. So it's kind of, I think you'd have to be a teacher that wants to kind of, you know, get your hands dirty a little bit and, and create something as an event for your students. Okay, cool. Can um, I, and I'll, yeah, can go ahead, Nikki. I, I didn't know if we were going around. Yeah, we but, can. Uh, yeah, we <laughs> <laughs> right. I really want to jump in on this because your librarian should be your tech go-to person. Your librarian should be that safety net in your school. If your librarian is not that person, then you need to take a serious look at what's going on in your library. But I would say that um, with listening to what Eric was saying as well, the way I'm thinking of incorporating it, um, the, the um, breakout EDU to teachers, and what I've done is I've served as a co-teacher with them as I've introduced new technology. Don't let them... Um, I, I don't let them just go in their classrooms and try something on their own if they don't feel comfortable with that. I co-teach with them. And so using that breakout EDU kit as part of the makerspace and as an option of letting teachers send their kids in groups to the library to do the breakout EDU and let me help walk them through that process so they feel comfortable with it. I think would be a great way to approach that and probably what I'm going to go ahead and push for this last half of the school year. But again, um, 
you know, finding the way to do it and getting your librarian involved. If they're not the leader in your school, if they're not the one pushing the tech, if they're not the ones providing that tech support for the teachers, take a look at your librarians and get them involved with the TL chat community. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, we are now ready to pass the mic to Jason. We are at about halfway, and uh, we've almost gone through one. So we may, just a little preview for folks, we, we may go just a little beyond an hour, because I think it'd be good if everyone could, could get into two topics and two questions. So, Jason, what you got? So I'd like to talk a little bit about student data privacy, and um, I'm very inspired by the debate that's been around uh, the EFF's uh, a complaint that they filed with the United States Federal Trade Commission that um, Google, um, in particular their Google Apps for Education product, is collecting student data that first they're, they're not saying that they're collecting and that they're violating something called the Student Privacy Pledge. Um, and the reason why this is interesting to me is because I think that the data privacy obviously has taken a, a very increased uh, uh, volume of, of, of discussion in the broader tech community in the last three or four years. The Edward Snowden stuff, um, the uh, information related to uh, privacy with advertisements over the last few years, um, iOS 9 releasing an ad blocker, which has uh, uh, inspired a, a massive debate around whether or not we have the right to block advertisements, which fund a lot of the free tools that we utilize on the internet. These are all kind of intertwined in, in, a, in a larger issue. So I guess the question I would pose is first, um, are, are, we, are we really taking a risk by utilizing, um, and I'll make a broad claim here, that, that it's likely that any set of, of integrated tools like Google Apps for Education, I'm going to call it Office 365 for Education here, even though I have zero idea whether or not um, it utilizes similar conceptions or not, but you know, are we taking a risk by adopting these tools? And second, should we be taking more proactive stances um, to both protect uh, student data privacy on behalf of students, and more importantly, teaching students about student data privacy. Because it seems like that you know, we struggle in, in teaching about cyberbullying. We don't teach a lot of core technology skills. I know there was a, uh, a set of blog posts earlier this year saying that we should be teaching email skills to kids, which I, I couldn't agree with more. S uh, students lack a lot of really basic communication uh, skills related to technology. But should we add uh, data privacy, and how would we add data privacy to that list. <laughs> and I just realized I get to have this one first. So, wow, okay. Um, maybe I'll start with a story. One of our suburban Oklahoma City districts a year or so ago had a group of teachers that wanted to um, start using Google Apps for Education and got Chromebooks and had been to a conference. And <clears throat> at the board meeting, the discussion was all about privacy and Google and fear and the board ruled they could not adopt Google Apps. They're prohibited from doing it. And I, I've heard different discussions over the holiday and, and at other times too. Uh, FERPA, COPA, um, there's a deal I started a few years ago called Unmasking the Digital Truth because there, a layer of this has to do with the overblocking and filtering. But what, what I think you're talking about, Jason, is, is far more than that. It's not, you know, IT folks or administrators or somebody kind of applying draconian rules uh, to to protect student privacy you know we're, we're talking about the actual behavior of of these companies and what they are doing and and what steps we should be taking um, for privacy and security um, I don't know what the answer is I do know that everyone needs to be using a password <laughs> a password uh, app <laughs> like that that should New Year's resolution uh, and I was the IT guy I'm sending out these emails about security and backups you know back up your data and then what's your password you know uh, saving app um, I I th I definitely tend to be somebody who's way out there with you know sharing and like I just f fully embrace the sharing economy, but there are things that make me think twice about this, and things could go dark. In fact, I had to stop reading this book. I don't even want to recommend the guy's name, but it was it was about um, I'll say it. His name is Ronson, and it was about shaming and and telling these stories about people who, like the woman who was about to get on an international flight, and she she tweeted something that was very. Uh, 
racist about AIDS and folks in Africa. And then when she got out of this 10-hour flight, she was the number one trending topic on Twitter, and haters had just pretty much ruined her life and it was just it was a nightmare there are dark there can be dark sides to sharing um, I do think twice at the grocery store now when they're like oh and you have a phone number oh can we have an email because I know that what you know big box uh, merchandisers are doing is they're aggregating all that information and then they're using that to do targeted marketing but I'm not convinced it's evil I don't know I don't know about what I know that I need to think more about this topic, and I know that we have a responsibility in schools to be protecting privacy. And I, I guess my last, my closing thought, as I will pass it to Nikki, uh, is that it needs to be part of our digital citizenship curriculum. We are launching that this spring, and we're bringing Carl Hooker, who, by the way, if you don't know Carl, he's the tech director in EANS ISD in Austin. He has a free um, iTunes U course called, like, Growing Up Digital 101 or something. It's for parents. <clears throat> he was at South by Southwest EDU. He has a great um, video and presentation called Raised by Siri, and he's hilarious. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, he gets us thinking about the landscape, you know, and what's being shared and what are students doing and what are parents doing. So I don't know what all those answers are, but I know we need to be in dialogue about them and that it ought to be part of a regular digital citizenship curriculum conversation in, in schools. Nikki, you have better answers. What do you say? <laughs> I have better answers, but I have some thoughts. Um, first off, okay, so I understand we need to protect kids, blah, 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 but in protecting kids, are we going to go, okay, we can only use uh, stone and chisels now because that's not going to collect any information on us. So it's a good versus evil situation here. We need that technology. Who's providing that technology for us in an affordable manner? I, I, I drink the Google Kool-Aid. I love the Google Kool-Aid. I'm guzzling. I'll swim in it, whatever, you know. <laughs> I love what they provide and the ability for kids to collaborate for teachers to be able to see what's happening in real time. And I think that that overweighs some of the other things, but that's my personal opinion there. Also, um, as far as digital citizenship, we had this conversation on TL Newsnight, which um, is part of the teacher librarian community, is a monthly show. And we said we don't need to just be teaching. It shouldn't even be digital citizenship. We need to teach citizenship. And I had the great opportunity to work at Hoover High School with the amazing Jennifer Hogan and Holly Sutherland, who were my assistant principals there. And they started the Alabama Ed Chat and also U.S. Ed Chat. And we were very much a Twitter-connected school. We had a hashtag for our school, and we allowed our students to fail socially and with social media because we allowed them to use it. So when the whole yik yak thing came around, we flooded it. Our kids flooded it, our teachers flooded it, our administrators, our parents flooded yik yak with nothing but positive messages so that those who were being horrible stopped using it because it wasn't getting across the point they wanted to get across. So we, we took those opportunities at that school to use social media and model how to use social media in a correct manner, in a good citizenship, in a good citizen way. And if we had kids who didn't use it properly, we didn't punish the entire school, we didn't shut down that social media, we pull those kids in and we talk to them about the choices they were making and why those weren't wise choices. So I think instead of sticking our heads in the sand or blocking or getting angry about when kids use social media inappropriately, we need a model. And when they make mistakes, talk to them about it. Rather than send them out into the world not knowing anything about how to use social media properly. I have a Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and a Snapchat account for my school library. The kids love the Snapchat account. And I'm like, Snapchat, really? You know, I'm always asked Snapchat, you use Snapchat with the kids? I'm like, yes, because that's where the kids are. And I do the Snapchat stories and all day long throughout the entire day. I'm taking pictures of everything that's happening in my library and sending that out to wow. anyone who wants to see it. And so modeling, I think, is going to be extremely important for us to do, not just blocking, modeling proper use. And then we wouldn't have people on airplanes saying horrible things. <laughs> Eric? Well, I don't know if I have anything really that unique from, you know, Wes or, or Nikki. Um, 
I, I definitely think it's a balancing act between knowing what type of information, you know, Google or whatever organization you're using is collecting, but also seeing the value of that on the other side and being able to balance that out. So um, I guess I don't have any, like, deep thoughts on, on that topic um, other than just, you know, continuing to be aware of what's being collected and then trying to find that balance between is that a trade-off between what we want our students to do as, as far as collaboration. Um, obviously, all these tools are not free. There's always something on the back end that's being collected. But um, where does that fit into our, our district as far as being able to make that trade-off for value compared to what's being collected? All right. And Jason, you have the last word. So I would say that, that for me, the part of the complication here is, is that uh, the tool set is becoming powerful beyond our means to understand um, you know, what it means to put in our data into a device. And in fact, I'm, um, you know, I'm traveling right now. Um, I just looked at Google Now on my, my uh, Android phone, and it's managed to collect my entire itinerary and let me know what's going on. Uh, as I travel uh, you know, across the country in the next 48 hours. And that doesn't happen by accident. And one of the things I thought was most interesting about the, uh, the response to the um, EFF's uh, kind of anti-Google uh, complaint was that a lot of people said that, you know, you're right, but, right, that, that, that it's true that, that Google has to collect a lot of data on people to make their tools as functional as they are. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm also a Kool Aid drinker from Google. I, I love the the tools; they're amazing. Um, I yeah, very much so. Uh, uh, and um, I, I in fact I buy it by the case, as it turns out. But the the <laughs> reality is is that um, the reason why it's so awesome is because it um, it, it works so well, um, and that you know I do trade, I do give it a lot of my personal information um, because it gives me that personal information back in an organized and thoughtful manner. And uh, a couple IT directors, school IT directors, uh, responded to the EFF complaint by uh, issuing some blog posts saying that everything that the EFF is complaining about can be turned off. It's just that they wouldn't recommend you do so because your the tool set would be would be functionally useless. You know the fact that I can go to any computer on earth and sign in with one of my Google accounts and all uh, all my tool set instantly appears. Um, I can uh, easily go back to my standard workflow. Um, I can utilize the browser in the way that I'm used to and that I like it makes it a really effective and quite useful tool. And that's just not available in other tool sets partially because they don't collect data um, to make my experience better, right? So, yeah, I think it's something we're going to be hearing about a lot more in the coming, I think, 12 to 24 months. Um, I, it's interesting to hear your story, Wes, about um, a, a school board that says no to uh, utilizing that particular tool set. And I think we're going to hear that story um, more often than not in, in, in coming uh, months and years. And I think it's important, especially for those that are advocates for these tools, um, to you know start thinking about good ways to describe this so it is less scary. Um, you know, and, and also help people understand that they're probably giving away data in a much more uh, harmful way without even knowing it. Like, I trade my data to Google very... Um, uh, 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 well, it's, it's obvious to me. I know I'm giving it to them, right? And there are a lot more people collecting a lot more data on us than we care to say that we're not making conscious decisions about. So I think it's an interesting topic that we're going to hear a lot more about in coming months. All right. Well, awesome. Well, uh, we have gotten all the way around the table once. <laughs> it's about 47 minutes after. So what I'd suggest is let's, we'll try to we'll try to go around one more time, um, but we'll just do a little bit maybe shorter answers, uh, and then we'll we'll wrap up. So um, mine is going to be a little little more on the lighter side, a little happy happy here. What are your go-to apps right now in December 2015 for your personal learning? Like what what would you just totally be disrupted by if you were not able to use these apps or websites? For your own learning. Nikki. Twitter, 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 Twitter. <laughs> I love Twitter. Um, the key is the hashtag. And then also um, Flipboard. Okay. Eric? Uh, definitely Twitter and then also YouTube. Um, I mean, I, I'm using YouTube more and more for all kinds of things. Uh, my wife and I, three days ago, inherited a console radio from 1966. So far in the last two days, I found out how I could possibly repair it. Um, I've seen several people talk about different features on it. I mean, that's that's where I go to find information. So I would definitely say YouTube. Um, 
even more and more each day. All right. Jason? Um, I would also say Flipboard. Um, it's it's 80% of my visual uh, content acquisition is by Flipboard now. It's replaced uh, RSS feeds for me. Um, I'm also a very prolific podcast listener. Um, I, I mostly listen to podcasts via the uh, Android and iOS app Pocket Casts. Um, I probably subscribe to 250 uh, podcasts, of which I listen to 25 to 30 a week. Um, oh it's, it's nearly all. Yeah, it's nearly all of my content acquisition is that. Um, I do walk a lot, so that helps. I mean, I I don't have a commute in lovely Missoula, Montana, but I do have a lot of open space to take my dog on on long walks, and that's been my constant companion um, during that time. Um, I, I would add one other thought that with Eric mentioning YouTube, um, YouTube has increased in its uh, usefulness to me lately because of um, I subscribe to Google Music, which gives me a subscription to YouTube Red, which is their new ad-free service. But the subtle thing about YouTube Red is that it allows you to download YouTube videos to your mobile device so that you can watch them offline. Um, and I, I, I'd heard about that, uh, you know, on one of my uh, uh, many, many, many ridiculous tech podcasts, and forgot about it. And then I actually resubscribed to Google Music to get access to some music that that I wasn't available elsewhere. And then getting on a plane a week ago, um, I discovered that I could download, and in this case, three videos that I I watched on the airplane. And that's 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 a game changer for me. It makes it it makes it makes Google Music worth it. The ten dollars a month I pay for it worth it itself, right? The ads I don't really care about. I ignore them ninety percent of the time. But the fact that you can suddenly take that stuff and make it very mobile um, is is pretty extraordinary. Wow. Okay. Well, I did not know that. That is that is definitely a good thing to a good thing to know. Um, I'll also add that we're going to be putting these these uh, links in the show notes. So um, I've as we've kind of gone along, I've put the topics that we picked, and if our panelists have any of those other links that you'd like to include, um, I'll include. I'll put those in because we'll be making this into will be I'll be uh, my and my me and myself making this into an audio podcast um, so that folks can can check it out and take it with them. Um, my go-to apps are Twitter, Flipboard, Nuzzle, Pocket Cast, and every once in a while Feedly. Interesting how RSS readers you know are no longer. It's just like people are like, what what I remember again back in the day. It's like 2005. You know, we're trying to teach people about RSS. It's going to change your life. It's going to be so great. And it does, but it's more invisible. And Flipboard, I think Flipboard is the gateway drug for connected educators. Uh, maybe that's a bad way to say it, but it is, there's a better way to say it. But it, it I'm very <laughs> enthused that for ISTE this year, I had three things accepted. Never had that before. And one of them is a session called Discovering New Ideas. And again, this is that change in the vocabulary idea. Uh, so I'm not going to teach you about RSS. I'm going to teach you about discovering new ideas, something everyone needs to do. And Flipboard is that is that visual translator, I think, that takes feeds and social media and all this stuff. Yeah, and for me, Twitter lists in Flipboard are the bomb. It, it, so here's my, my last story, and then I'll pass to Nikki for her, her uh, last topic. This Christmas, okay, so my son turned 18, uh, we're applying to schools, we went up to the Northeast, uh, got to visit both uh, RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in, Al in Albany, New York, and then a school named Olin, which is in Needham, Massachusetts, outside Boston. And it's because a friend of mine, her husband, is with NASA and works at the Houston Space Center. I follow, I love astronaut stuff, right? It's so cool to get to see pictures fly from the ISS. In fact, Apple TV has a free app where you can see a live HD shot from the space station. Of course, half the time it's dark. Ooh, I wonder why. Um, but, you know, when it's not on the dark side of the planet, it's awesome. So because of that Twitter list in Flipboard, <clears throat> I learned about an astronaut named Ron Guerin who's written a book called Orbital Perspective, which basically says if you go up in space, you do not look at the planet the same anymore because you recognize, oh, gosh, look, there are no political boundaries. Oh, wow, look at, you know, just it, it changes your life. And so I gave that book to my son for Christmas this year. Uh, he's a budding engineer and wants to – who wants to go help colonize Mars. Um, and then there's another book that uh, Chris Hatfield, who's the Canadian astronaut that sang the David Bowie song and just like total rock star astronaut, uh, his book. So 
in a tangible way, Flipboard affected our Christmas because my son has two books, which may inspire him to do more, you know, studies of, of you know, engineering and uh, astronomy and aeronautical engineering and all kinds of cool stuff. And it's just, it's so neat how when you follow folks that have a passion that you're interested in, it can lead you down amazing rabbit holes of learning. And then you have a chance to share those kind of things out. All right, I went too far too long. Nikki, you're up. Last topic for you. All right, Eric, what's on your shirt? Is that going to unmute, unmute? Yes. Gotcha. Um, it's a Google Cardboard. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's yeah. what I want to talk about. <laughs> Google Cardboard and virtual reality. I'm so mad because I want to get in on the Google Expeditions and get the set of cardboard and the, um, what is it, Asus uh, phone to be able to use with it. And I, I'm not accepted yet. I want that. What, what are your thoughts on Google Cardboard, virtual reality, and the use of that in the classroom? All right, hey. Eric. A good one for Eric to answer. All right. Well, um, two years ago, I started taking a lot of photospheres with my cell phone, and I posted about probably 200 photospheres. And um, I like the fact that you can use that to kind of create your own content for Google Cardboard. Um, I've used it with my students just a little bit as just kind of like a a fun kind of, I don't know, just kind of check out what it is type of thing. Um, I also have not been accepted for expeditions. And, um, I'm hoping eventually at some point they'll come through. Um, but um, I, I did spend quite a bit of time at Mount Vernon this summer as a, a research fellow. And I know that they're working on potentially some ways that you can do like tours and things of historical sites and like the expedition stuff. Um, so I think, that, I think it has potential. I think that it's obviously very new. But um, I think that the fact that you could have one teacher lead a class in an historical site using expeditions um, has some potential for the classroom. So, but I, I want to be able to have students also create some, some content. Um, I have a Nexus 6 phone, so um, it works pretty well as far as creating that type of content, but that it becomes a little bit more universal. Um, I got the Star Wars one from Verizon a couple weeks ago and went into the store and got that. And, oh, man, um, they, they only got like 12 of them in all of Oklahoma City. So oh, really? You must have been a better better distributor yeah, just, location in Kansas City. So, um, one of the things that I've used with my with Google <laughs> Cardboard is um, there's so many different kinds. And when you have one that's cardboard and you pass it around, it gets really oily and students, you know, there are students using it. So um, I don't think I have it with me right now. Actually, I might have it with me. I do. So you can get them like this, too. So like this is um, plastic, but then you put your phone in like this, and these cost about the same as cardboard, but then it's a little bit less, like you could actually wipe this down and stuff, and it also fits a variety of different types of phones. So you don't have to have one piece of cardboard that's being passed around for months with like hundreds of kids. So. Now what is that? Um, it's... Um, it's from a Google Tech. Um, it's a VIP. I can share a link in the show notes. Yeah, sure. Um, but it comes with a little. We, we ordered, we ordered twenty of them this summer on recommendations from from Eric uh, because uh, unlike the cardboard, you, like he said, you could wipe it down with a cloth. And it's small. You can put it just like a glass case, and so it's a little bit easier to share. It's more universal as far as the size because, like, you know, I have a Nexus Six, so like only the huge, super size ones will fit. Um, my phone, but on this you could fit a variety of different phones. You can like narrow it down, um, so you could have an iPhone or a smaller phone, and it works the same. It just isn't as ex as ex exclusive. It's not like you know, it's not like you're immersed in it maybe as much as cardboard, where it's, it's almost like it's dark. But um, when I share Google Cardboard, I usually share it with this, and it's been easy for people to use. So you're putting that link in, right, Wes? Or, yeah, uh, Eric will put it in. I'll put that in. Yep. Now, what I did do with my cardboard and my makerspace, because I noticed the same problem as the kids used it, it would rip and tear because, it, you know, it's cardboard, is I did what every good southern person does, is I got duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> the pretty decorative duct tape, though, and I covered all the cardboard in the duct tape, and yeah. now it's just perfect, and you can wipe that off, and, and right. so that works well, too. All right, awesome. Jason. Um, yeah, I, I, VR is interesting to me. Um, I, I know that a lot of the in your podcasts um, have said that this is the year that that the VR wasn't, because it was on everyone's mind at um, the Consumer Electronics Show in January, 
and there was a lot of, of energy around it, and it it, it it kind of stayed like a constant buzz as opposed to decreasing and increasing or decreasing. And so I'm hoping 2016 becomes the year um, that you know we start seeing more of the breakout applications that you know can really deliver kind of VR to the masses. Um, one of the things that I think has been very encouraging is that um, you know, there's cheap cheap applications available, right? Like, w schools are not going to invest $500 a headset in fancy VR helmets um, that, you know, arguably may last a year or two uh, before they become, um, you know, either outdated or broken. Um, kind of the Google Glass uh, disappointment um, uh, w would be similar to, to what I think VR could have been. But now the cardboard is available, and there are uh, the, I don't know if you saw the Viewmaster VR uh, uh, application. They released a branded VR, uh, 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 I, not even helmet, little uh, thing that looks like an old school Viewmaster, right? Really? It's like $30 at Walmart. Okay. Um, and that the fact that that's available and that people are making cheap applications to this, the kids can slip their own phones into, that's, that's really exciting. And I think that's going to probably provide us a, a lot of, of interesting applications of this technology in schools. Um, but I, I think that someone out there that we haven't discovered yet has the magic key that's going to light this on fire. And I'm really looking forward to, to, to seeing what that person does. We're, we're, we're close, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, so I just dropped into the chat um, a short link, wfryer.me slash cardboard. I've been using a Google Docs for the different workshops that I've done with our teachers and faculty. And like I said, I ordered on Eric's recommendation shortly after I started my, my new job this summer a set of 20 of the Google Cardboard plastic versions that he recommended. Um, best thing I've done so far is there's an app called Verse, V-R-S-E, that has different stories, and there's one called Clouds Over Sidra, which is about a 12-year-old Syrian refugee, and part of the goal there is to develop empathy for refugees in Syria and the whole crisis that's there, and it's essentially like, a, it's, it's like narrated photospheres, so as she's narrating and talking, you're in this photo bubble that you can move around and look, you know, look, oh, look, they're making the flatbread on the side of the, you know, fire, you know, and, and here they're in the gym lifting weights. Very different, really immersive, and uh, like Eric, I want to create, I've, I, my favorite app for creating 360-degree photospheres is Bubbly, B-U-B-B-L-I, um, and I, oh, and I just learned, and maybe Eric, I don't know where I saw this, inside, because Eric, Eric said, I have to ditch my iPhone and get a Nexus phone. I'm like, no, Alice Keeler said that too. Um, it, on iOS, my question was, no, I'm not doing it. This. Do it. Um, <laughs> so Alice Keeler said too, you have to get uh, an Android phone. No, in the Google Place View app for iOS, you can create a photosphere that is is there inside uh, Google Place uh, Street Street View. So in the Street View, you can create, you can look at, because one of our teachers uh, who teaches about the uh, you know Greek history, she said, if you can take me to the Parthenon, you've sold me. And I was like, okay, here we go. So you know, we got the Parthenon, and they're they're in uh, Athens or whatever, but you can create it as well. Okay, it is 12. We're at the top of the hour, uh, but we, but I do want to, like I said, finish finish the round. So uh, we'll go to Eric uh, one more time. We'll go to Jason as well. Um, but Nikki, I guess you have to answer your own question first. I'm jumping the gun. So your, your closing thoughts on Google Cardboard because you you posed it. So finish that well, off for us. I agree with the panel that 2016, I'm hoping, will be the year. And um, the New York Times did send out a free Google Cardboard to every subscriber with their, news, with their newspaper. So I know the push is getting there. Also with Verse, it's, if you haven't looked at Verse on Google Cardboard, it's so interesting, the news stories and everything that you get to watch in virtual reality. So I think it, uh, finding how we're going to connect that to curriculum now is, is the big thing for us to figure out. All right. Eric, what's your last topic for us? All right, just real simply, I don't remember who posted it, but there was there been a couple blog posts kind of on this um, topic, but the whole idea that, um, and I'm a classroom teacher, I also do cons consultation and stuff like that, but I think that what classroom teachers really want or embracing is the fact that, you know, let's find one or two tools that are really going to help me, and let's dig into those. Instead of giving me, like, 25 different tools 
that I might try for one day and get frustrated and not get through the learning curve and stuff. I mean, we're to the point now where we need to like find a couple tools that are really good and it might be different for a science teacher, it might be different for a history teacher, or whatever, but let teachers get deeper into tools instead of having this buffet of just a bazillion different things. And I'm not an instructional coach, but um, I do help other teachers a lot in our district and our building and stuff. But like helping people find something that they can dig into and spend an entire year trying to utilize instead of just getting the, the scratching the surface of you know, 10 different tools this year. Um, and you run the risk, obviously, of like investing maybe too much into one tool that might be gone, but that's, that's reality. But just the whole digging deeper, utilize a tool to its fullest potential um, instead of having 30 different things that you're trying to do in the classroom. Jason, what do you see as those dig deeper tools that you'd start teachers with? Well, I mean, I, 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 not to over over flipboard today. I mean, I think that's a good example of one that that is, um, it's the closest to bridging an old way of ex accessing information and a new way to access information. And once you start getting past the surface of it and kind of the glitz of the tool, you could start to see a daily way that you could, you know, uh, expand your mind a little bit in in learning new things or going deeper on on content that you may not have. Uh, uh, considered before, and I think that that's though that particularly on, on a mobile device uh, could really you know expand someone's mind, expand someone's mind. From maybe a little more of a practical standpoint, um, I, I I like a, a good multitask tool in, in an OS, and for me that that go-to multitask tool is. Uh, um, and I totally forgot the name of it. Wow, that's really awkward. Um, I'm going to now do a Google search. <laughs> We can pick up, pick up the slack with a little extra dialogue. Mult uh, multicast, you're meaning uh, video conferencing? Uh, well, no, as in like something that does more than one thing so that you have it always in your tool. Uh, Snagit is the name of the tool. Wow, how did I forget that? Uh, We're you know, getting Snagit, old. It's a sign. Uh, it's a apparently sign. so. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the thing about Snagit is that it, you know, I, once I've one of the things that I, I, I think a lot of people struggle with, uh, especially when you're communicating digitally and remotely, is the fact that you can't point at something, right? Like, you know, like this is wrong or this is where I'm having the problem. Um, and, and I experience this obviously much more aggressively in, in my context because none of my teachers and none of my students are local. So, you know, we have any any given time um, five thousand people who um, I I can't point at ever, right? And so um, a snag is, a, is an example of a tool for me that, you know, can really provide a way of pointing at something or a way of showing something in a way that you can't ever describe via email. And I'm, um, you know, I, I like to find ways to efficiently use a tool. So for me, it's uh, 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 setting up Snagit and then hooking it to Google Apps so that it automatically creates a link so that I'm clicking as, the least amount as possible to show things. But I think finding a, a nice Nice productive application like that, and just really, you know, uh, uh, showing the seven or eight things you can do with it, and then practicing it uh, 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 a number of times, I think is really a critical piece to getting that buy-in uh, process for teachers. Awesome, Nikki. Uh, Google Classroom for me is definitely the tool I would want teachers to delve into. Uh, our teachers, I feel, so far this year have gotten a really good grasp on how to use it with their students. But what I but what I stand out to is, is how we can use that to then connect with other students in other classrooms in other states and countries, and how we can bring that real world authentic learning into our classrooms using a uh, Google Classroom. Did I skip myself? I think I did. <laughs> I just got out of order. Um, but wouldn't it be cool if Google Classroom brought in the global part? Because that is still something that's so rare as far as connecting out to other classrooms. My wife was just talking yesterday. She met with a friend who's teaching second grade here in the city and, and like literally driving down to her school today. We we're talking about, well, she could do a, a hangout, you know, in order to connect. They're teaching the same things or to learn together. Um, my go-to <clears throat> apps to try to really hook teachers are... Um, Voice Record Pro on the iPad, um, and then I also uh, have really liked Audio Boom, but it's it, it's a I love 
tools that can let you pick up a device, take a picture, and then use your voice to record with it. So working with our elementary art teacher, she's going to have a, an art walk coming up in the spring. And so hopefully this time, for the first time, we'll have some QR codes where parents and others will be able to scan and be able to hear more about you know the student artwork and the fact that Audio Boom automatically creates that QR code and you can print it and it's labeled and it just makes that really quick. Um, you know, I, I, I see them kind of as gateway, gateway drugs is bad, but it's like, it's, we, it's a hook, you know, it's like if, you, if we can hook teachers into the possibilities of what this can do rather than fearing, I mean, oh, it's going to take away our social skills and, you know, we're all going to be lost in the technology and our privacy. There's so much fear, you know, there's a, I, I love audio, I love podcasts, I love the spoken word, so I think uh, apps and tools that allow students to readily put their voice with their work, and then be able to share that back home. Um, I would, that's what I would love to see teachers invest more in. Certainly Google Classroom has been hugely transformative in our building, but or in our, our, our school, but it's not transformative in the same way that using audio to then talk about your work and, and student voice and that whole piece. So I, it's kind of powerful in, in a different way. Eric, it's back to you. What, what, what would you? What's your answer to your own question there about those tools? Um, we're one to one eighth grade. Every eighth grader has a MacBook. Every teacher has a MacBook. So I've really been trying to um, teach people how to use iMovie since they have it on their device. Um, my students use it for recording family histories. Um, we've done some things with like creating a little like what I've learned this semester, kind of like pre-conference video. Um, we've had students do a lot of reflections with it. So I guess personally, I've been trying to really push. I, I movie and I have so many teachers say, oh my gosh, it's been on my computer for you know two years. I've never actually opened the app. I could totally use this a lot um, in my teaching. And then once students have that tool, they find a lot of ways to use it in different classes. So probably iMovie is the one that I'm really trying to get people to dig deeper on in our own particular building. All right, awesome. All right, Jason, to round us out, my, my laptop has 15%, so I'm sure we're going to be okay, done before so that's dead. We'll, we'll do, <laughs> I'll do that quickly then. Um, I guess, uh, let me throw this question out. What hardware was exciting for folks this year? Did anyone buy anything new? Um, is there any hardware platform that you think is interesting for education or for educators? And let's, let's, do, let's do that topic. Okay, yeah, and I get to get it first. Uh, well, um, so I definitely say my iPhone 6, uh, slow motion video. Um, I used that quite a bit in the last two years teaching STEM. Um, amazingly, and here I am in this maker studio, the most popular station out of Lego Stop Motion, Minecraft EDU, Green Screen, um, Digital Music, Sphero, all these things. What was it? Rube Goldberg. My kids loved making Rube Goldberg projects. And what made that shareable was iPhone slow motion video. and. People probably look at this and think, are you kidding me? You really do this in school? And this is, I mean, some people might really wonder about it, but the learning and the excitement and the joy and the curiosity and all kinds of great things that happened in a makerspace happened around the Rube Goldberg, basically with PVC pipe, marbles, some open foam like sort of like um, pooled noodles that were cut in half at, where you know you can make the marble go down a minimum of duct tape because I learned they'd use all kinds of duct tape if you gave that unlimited but <clears throat> you know we have some recorded slow motion video with the iPhone that were on our YouTube channel and it was just so exciting and 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 I love the way that media in the classroom can help elevate kids expectations of what's possible and what they can do and it also can open up their mind to see their classmates doing things that whoa oh my gosh so and so did this and and you celebrate that victory together so I would say slow motion video on the iPhone 6 that is my answer Nikki what's your hardware Oh, the hardware I've had the most fun with and that the kids have really gravitated towards this year is our 3D printer. We have a MakerBot replicator, fifth generation. And I love that our teachers have started to use it. Our biomed teacher, Ms. McRae, um, her students are researching proteins and how proteins affect you know, different health issues like Alzheimer's or arthritis and different things like that. And so the students have made... Um, their proteins and had them printed out onto our 3D printer to then display uh -huh. in the classroom and we're using Erasmus then to have that 3D image 
pop up with a video where they're explaining about their protein and the research that they've done. So I'm loving the 3D printer. Can you share a link to any of that, like photos or any of that? Is an amazing project. Yeah, everything's on um, my blog. Um, I always blog about everything going on in our school and the cool stuff that's happening. Um, also, it's on all of our library social media. Um, we're at JCHS underscore library. On almost every social media you can think of. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Well, we'll make, please make sure you get that in the in the show notes. Eric, I will. what's your, what's your right. hardware description? Uh, from a hardware perspective, we've been using a swivel robot. Um, so a swivel robot is kind of a base. I don't. They just rearranged my rooms. So they just got recarpeted, but it's a base um, that you can put um, uh, iPad in, or you can put your phone in. But the nice thing about it is you wear a lanyard that has a microphone attached to it, and then it'll move and rotate and film as you move around the classroom. And if you have an iOS device, it will also pick up the audio. So the way we have used it this year several times is I've helped our student teachers in the building. They have to create a video when they turn in their um, certification, certification type stuff. And so they're able to move around the classroom and it records them really easily and it, it captures the audio. So if they're helping a student, you can actually hear it from across the room. And um, we've just been trying to find a lot of ways to have teachers kind of reflect on watching themselves teach and kind of get a different perspective. And it's a, a swivel robot. It's not something that every teacher would want. Um, it's something that maybe like a building or a district would get and then just kind of maybe share it throughout the building or the district. Okay, and before we pass it to Jason to finish up, if anyone has a last-minute question, you can tweet it in to pound uh, 2015 EdTech Review or post the Q&A, and then we're going to wrap up. So, Jason, what, what, what you got? Well, um, this year for me has been... Um, um, well, I would say there are three things that have impacted me from a hardware standpoint. First, I, I, I jumped in and I got an Android Wear watch. Um, and and I and I, I like it. It's um, I I know some folks with Apple watches. I know some folks with Android watches, and right now they're they're just fancy notification uh, appendages. I guess would be the best way to to describe them. There's not a really revolutionary um, um, way to use it yet, and it's been great traveling. And I and I do find that I I, I touch my phone less, which is probably a good thing, and also probably good for my marriage. But um, it's um, there, it's it's getting there. At some point, this is going to be awesome. It's not quite there yet. Um, the second thing that's been a, a big deal for me this year is that I've rediscovered uh, the Windows platform. Um, I think the the release of Windows 10 has made a really big uh, splash in the Microsoft universe. Um, not that big of a splash because uh, you know I'm carrying my MacBook around. And I still use an iPad and and yada yada yada. But um, I do think that that the, the game has become a little more complex for me. And in fact, whereas I would have used a Chromebook before, I'm going to more or less a a, a Windows computer now, which I wouldn't have done before. I've taken you know four year old uh, laptops that were sitting around in closets in the office and threw an SSD drive and Windows 10 on there, and it's as fast or faster than something that I could buy off the shelf um, at, at, at a, a retail computer store. So I think that's been a big change for me. And then, um, I don't know if you saw the news yesterday, but AT&T announced that they're getting rid of uh, all phone subsidies, and so all cell phones from AT&T now will be retail priced, and my guess is T-Mobile, um, Verizon, um, uh, uh, and, and a lot of the minor carriers will also go in that direction as well. And what that's done for me is that it's rekindled my my uh, interest in low-end cell phones. Um, there's a large number of mid-range low-end cell phones. They're actually pretty pretty decent. This is a, 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 a Moto G 2014 edition that I picked up for uh, $20 at a at Best Buy on sale. I slapped my Verizon card in it, and it's now... Um, at least temporarily, my daily driver. Um, I think that's going to really impact how um, uh, I, I think uh, uh, BYOB schools uh, are impacted. As more and more kids get cheap cell phones, as opposed to you know three-year-old iPhones or four-year-old Android devices, you can get a newer device that is is cheap. I think that's going to probably impact the way at least students are using our technology. And so I think that's a trend we should keep an eye on as well. Okay, awesome. Well, you thought we were done. I have 7% left on my MacBook. <laughs> and uh, we have a question from Twitter. So Nick Davis, this is our last one to go around the, the, the corner with, or go around the horn. What is one book you have read or looking forward to reading that is about ed tech? 
Uh, so I'll go first. Um, I'm reading Making Writing by Angela Stockman because I learned about it during Ed Camp Foxer, and it's about how the making in the, the, the maker space, the STEM space, can be a great catalyst for writing, and it ties into John Dewey and what he says about education as experience, and it's about the writing workshop, which I love, and so it's called Make Writing by Angela Stockman. Nikki? I'm so ashamed. I'm a librarian, but I'm not reading any books on ed tech. <laughs> I listen to great uh, YA books, um, audio books. They're audible as I drive because I have a 25-minute drive to work each day. So I'm ashamed. <laughs> no, no. Well, so what's a book you're reading though? Just give us a give us a book recommendation. Oh, um, the Pulitzer Prize-winning book this year. Um, uh, All the Light You Cannot See, I think is the name of it. That was just amazing. It, it was, I, I believe that's the title of it, but it was an amazing book. And I'm on the book three of Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children right now. <laughs> okay. If you don't mind dropping those links in, sometimes book, book recommendations are the best thing you can get out of a podcast. Eric? No, um, I don't. I haven't read a lot of ed tech stuff lately. I read a lot of history stuff. Um, right now, I'm uh, working on finishing up the book from the Nebraska astronaut um, Clayton Anderson. Um, I believe it's called The Ordinary Spaceman um, or The Ordinary Astronaut. Um, I my goal for 2016 is to actually finish the book that I have a draft of, and it's um, about how to teach history using technology. Its uh, tentative title is um, History Geek Teacher. So awesome. Um, awesome. hopefully that will be done this year. So. Awesome. All right, Jason, round us out. What's your book recommendation? Um, I am two chapters into the uh, Stephen Levin and Stephen Dubner book, Think Like a Freak. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, current follow-up to their original uh, Freakonomics book. And what I like about it, what I like about all their work is that um, I do think that, that educational technology oftentimes introduces uh, push and pull factors into learning that sometimes can be great and sometimes can be not so great and sometimes can be synergistically positive and sometimes synergistically negative. And so I'm really looking to that book to provide me some um, a mindset that I could use in adopting new tools and and new ways to teach and learn in the classroom. Okay, well, awesome. Well, if you've hung with us or whatever you've hung, maybe you were listening to this on the audio. Uh, we've been going for an hour and twenty minutes, and we're actually going to wrap up. So I want to say thank you so much to to Nikki, to Jason, to Eric, our panelists. This was so much fun. Um, I will share a public link to our Google Doc uh, right away after I hang up, and we will be dropping those links in, and then you'll be able to find this um, Google Hangout as a podcast that will be available on my blog, which is Speed of Creativity. Org. So we wish everybody an excellent, awesome 2016, and we'll hopefully look forward to not only connecting with each other, but connecting with you. Send us a shout-out, a tweet, and let us know if you end up listening or hearing this, and do anything with any of the ideas you hear, because we all need to share more. We will all benefit when we do. So, Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks.